Welcome back. You're watching Greatness Quest. I'm Trevor Crane, and every single week I'm bringing you someone absolutely extraordinary to go ahead and help you in your business. And today I've got Gulliver Giles. Gulliver, Gulliver Giles. And he is known as the sales warlord. He works with his life, wife, uh -huh. Leela. So, brother, thanks for being here, my friend. It's my absolute pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what's cool? Nobody knows this unless I would tell them. I just shot you a Facebook message about three minutes ago and said, brother, can we do this interview right now? Because I've got a new book that's coming out called High Paying Clients. And I thought, from what I know of this cat, and a friend of ours, mutual friend, introduced me to Gulliver, said this guy is completely bad. He and his wife are a phenomenal team. They are sales gurus. Today, we're talking about the art of sales. And so, brother, tell me, what's the magic mojo you've got to help someone with sales? Oh, look, I suppose it depends who they are. I mean, when we, pe when we have people come through the door, usually we have three people. We have the guy who is scared, the guy who really, you know, probably like he's either in a sales role or he's an entrepreneur, he's starting his business, and he's, he's got some bad vibes around sales, like he's had a bad experience. Once upon a time, someone sold him something that he didn't really need or didn't really want. And instead of taking responsibility for that, he's made that a story about how salespeople are all devil-worshipping Satanists who eat babies and hate Jesus or whatever it might be. <laughs> or it could be that he's actually been the devil-worshipping Satanist baby-eating salesperson that we all know and love. So in society, we have this big stigma, um, definitely more, probably more in Australia than in America, that you know money is bad and sales is bad and sales is basically a complicated way of screwing somebody and it's something disgusting that we do to each other for the love of money, which I don't agree with. Um, but people come to me with this attitude and they need to be healed and cleansed of that, 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 that horrible, limiting belief. Um, so I guess the second kind of person comes to me is a guy like you, uh, really great at talking to people, really loves people, great people person, um, except maybe unlike you, he doesn't have any system. He has no idea how to structure a sales approach. He really does like, he just kind of does the old, well, my good buddy Frank Kern would call it the rectal extraction method of sales. So he's just <laughs> pulling it out of thin air um, and hoping that it works. And sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. And it kind of bugs him that he doesn't know how to get a consistent 50 to 80% conversion on his $10,000, $15,000 program because he just doesn't really know and he hasn't got any tools to actually do that. So that's the second area. Um, and the third area I help is like guys like my buddy Ryan Dice, who he's got a sales team and he's starting up a phone room and he's a great marketer, but he hasn't actually built a sales team previously and he needs someone to come in and put together the manual and the objection handling and the system and the script and the coaching and understand the, the various bugbears and vagaries of managing salespeople because it can be like managing cats you know hurting hurting a bunch of felines they're all running off doing their own thing so getting a system in place and a structure that unites them and makes them an army of sales warriors who fight for the business who push the boundaries of growth who grow the business who protect the business's cash flow with a flaming sort of holy vengeance so those are the three areas i really like to help in um and i guess my mojo my mojo my philosophy is Sales is about love. It's about loving people. It's not about screwing people. It's not about snorting a bunch of cocaine and flying your helicopter full of strippers into a mountain of freaking dollars. It's loving people enough to call them. And it's also about self-respect. It's about how to be, well, not to be pushy, but to not be a pushover. So when, when you're selling, for instance, like I do, if you're selling a $75,000 program, to an entrepreneur who's you know doing a million but wants to go to 10 million or whatever it might be, they're going to have some fears come up. They're going to have some problems come up. They're going to try their very best to slit their own throat and sabotage their success by coming up with a reason why they can't do it because it's going to be too much time to spend to learn how to make that money or it's going to be too much money to learn how to increase their money or it's going to be a problem their partner has because you know their partner's been nagging at them to get help or whatever bullshit lie they've come up with. So not being pushy, but helping them understand how badly they're screwing themselves. So love and self-respect, but having enough respect for yourself to say, look, my product is for sale, but my self-respect is not, and I hear you bullshitting yourself, and I'm going to call you out on that right now. I love, love that. and self-respect. 
No, man, it's great. And it, uh, it, you know, in my book, I talk about the belief, your beliefs. I mean, a lot, I've got a blueprint and a system and I do this very, something very similar for my clients is I help them with that system that they most oftentimes don't have. Unlike you, I'm not usually focused on someone who has that system, which you're saying that you're working with Ryan Dice, who's the one of the co-owners of uh, Digital Marketer, phenomenal company, making millions and millions of dollars. They already have a process and a system that you go in and help train their whole team, which is phenomenal. But what I do, everybody wants my blueprint. They want my, I have something called the $300,000 Holy Grail. Because the first time my wife and I used it, starting our own consultancy, we went out and in a year working part time, we made about 300 grand. Yeah, we had, we made some sales. We did really well. We thought that was kind of cool. We'll, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll give that away. But too often times I've had people grab the system and then they go out and they don't have the belief. Like you said, they're self-sabotaging themselves. They think sales is yucky. They've been, they, or, or, or they're that salesperson and they're so, what could, the common question I get, tell me about this. What do I need to say to someone to get them to buy? That's what they always want to know. What do I got to say? And I'm thinking, dude, stop saying anything. Start asking questions. Find out how you can help and serve your clients. So I love your stuff. Um, give me some comments. Your gestures are great here. I'm like, man, you're speaking to me. <laughs> what does all this mean? We're on the same page. Mm. We're on the same page. People, you know, you've seen um, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, you know. Sure. A D A. Get their attention. Get them to be interested. Get them to, to to tell you what their decision is and get them to take action. And it's like, that's good. And it works. I eat as I'm going to interrupt you. We're going to do a quick break and we'll be back with Gulliver Giles. Welcome back. You're watching Greatness Quest. And today I'm here with sales warlord Gulliver Giles. Brother, thank you for being here. And we we're just talking about the art of sales, and we just went over your psychology that sales is not this yucky. Uh, you were talking about the movie that everybody knows about, where it's like, you know, A I D A. And you're like, you know what? Sales is about love. So talk to me, brother. What is sales really? So, A I D A attention, interest, decision, action. We're taught at sales school. When we're getting that yellow pages book handed to us and it's like make three sales or you're out in the bricks, you are shit if you can't close that whole thing. And yeah. I went through that in cold yeah. calling. Aida, attention, interest, decision. You have to get their attention. You have to get their interest. You have to get a decision. You have to get them to take action. No, you have to give them your attention. Mm. You have to. Salespeople have two ears and one mouth and it should be used in that order. You have to be interested, genuinely, psychotically interested in them, like stalky ex-girlfriend interested in them. Like, oh, my God, that's amazing. Tell me more about you. Oh, my God, you're so interesting, really genuinely interested in them. And you have to have a genuine desire to help them and show them how you think you can help and align that with their desires. And you have to have an action to give them that they know that that's going to be the right action for them. It's about giving, not taking. And, yeah, you're right. It's about listening. Yeah. Yeah. Being attentive, being interested. And that's where the real self people come to me. Oh, Gulliver, I want to close like a boss. I want to like, I want to fly my helicopter into a, a pile of cocaine and, and it's going to be awesome. And I'm going to smash my Maserati because that's what sales is all about. It's like, no, it's not, dude. Sales is about loving people enough to care about them in the first. You can't close a door that isn't open. You can't close a sale that isn't open. Opening someone up to talk about the things that really matter, the emotional stuff that matters to them will lead you to the logical issues that you can solve for them. And once you've shown them that, then we can help them. But not until you figured out what, but I just want to get straight to the money. It's kind of like those PUA guys who want to like row hypnol girls into sleeping with them. And I was like, and I walk into the bar and I walk up to every single chick and say, hey, would you like to suck my, you know, or whatever. It's not going to happen. She, and if it does, you're probably going to catch something. So it's got to be building the relationship and not being focused on the end product, but being focused on understanding that person. And that's funnily enough, same issue everyone has with sales fear. They're worried about this part, not this part. So first you have to worry about getting your intro right and then validating why you're there and then reversing their risk that, hey, it's, it's cool. I'm not here to just beat the crap out of you. I want to know more about you. And then you've got to get your probing right. And then you've got to get your initial closing, getting them to be interested in the next stage, taking them through the breakthroughs, getting them to tell you why they need it, and then you can make an offer. 
and then you can ask for the order. And then when they've got problems and objections, instead of giving up and flying away because they said they were worried about money, time, information, partner, trust, whatever it is, actually bothering to try and handle those problems for them. But everyone worries about that. What are they going to say at the end? What are you going to ask them at the start? How are you going to figure out how you can help them? And only then could you be worried about what happens at the end. My sales process is a process of convincing myself that it's right for them. So at the end, I have no fear. And they feel that from me rather than it being a process of trying to convince them, which is the wrong position. A man convinced against his will is of the same mind still. So I mean, if you can be convincing, that's great. You, can, you might be able to influence a sale, but as soon as they're out of your touch, man, they have that buyer's remorse and they're gone. And they, they, they're pissed off because they feel screwed because you convinced them into something. And that might be... That might be okay if you're working in an industry where you're, you know, you're selling junk shares in a chop shop or you're selling like dodgy real estate where you've just got to get them to sign and then you've got them and you've screwed them out of their life savings and you can fly off in your, you know, in your Lamborghini or whatever it is. In coaching, my relationship with you begins with this first sale and I want to sell you my 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 seventy five thousand dollar a year program, but then I want to sell you my elite level five hundred thousand dollar a year sales coaching, and then I want to sell you my amazing experiential cool thing for CEOs. I'm going to sell you all these different things. If I don't do the right thing by you here, it's just such a short term win lose, not win win. And and I think sales anything that is not selling from that place of love and self respect and trying to figure out if you can help and saying no to the 10 people you're not going to help so that you can get to the three or four people that you can help. That's not sales. It's just fraud. It's lying. It is all those things. But I want to change that. I want to see people understand that sales is not about lying. Sales is an honorable, decent trade like being a doctor or anything else. Lying and being a fraudster is lying and being a fraudster. That's, that's the big distinction to me. Well, and if people aren't making the sale, I mean, that's the lifeblood of their business. I mean, I break a business down into three things. They're very simple, leads, sales, and fulfillment. And so oftentimes I ask that question of like what percentage of time is someone spending in their business on leads, sales, or fulfillment? And they pretty much are comfortable spending time in fulfillment, typically. Your, your service providers, your product providers, they're like, ooh, let me spend more time serving my client after they become a client. But they're not spending their focus on getting leads, which is marketing and how you be cool to them so they come to you in the first place. But I think the magic point where I like to help someone, and it sounds like you do too, it doesn't cost that much money to go ahead and improve the way that you engage your prospect and convert them into a sale. Like it's a way that you can make money immediately if you just improve your process. You can talk to almost anybody. You know, a lot of people ask me like, where do I find my high paying client? You're mentioning numbers that are pretty extraordinary. Like my base level program is a $75,000 a year program. That sounds like a lot to someone who's thinking about coaching and consulting. So where do you think people find their high paying clients? Well, Peter Drucker once said that the purpose of a business is to create a client. Yeah. A lot of people, you see guys out there saying, you know, I haven't found the perfect girl. You see girls out there saying, I haven't found the perfect guy. You don't find the perfect girl, the perfect guy very often. I think you make them. You make them through working the hard work with them to create that relationship. I've been married for a few years now and I've been together with my, my wife for 10 years in total and we were like cats and dogs, kind of loggerheads at first and we've built this incredible relationship. We still have our challenges but it was built from love. I believe with sales, it's the same thing building a salesperson. If you don't listen to them, don't monitor them, don't care about them and just, you know, go make me some money and fuck off, then you're going to get screwed every time. They're going to be the ones that do the dodgy deals, that get the refunds and returns, that screw your whole business up because you didn't put in the care and love them, right? Same with clients. I have had clients who struggled to put down $500 to get to my event, who then ended up two years clients with me paying 50 grand a year. So I loved them and nurtured them to get them there. Brother, I love that you said that because I have taught that as well as that your ideal client is right in front of you. You just haven't figured out how to nurture them. So here's the deal. We're going to take another quick break and come back with some more of the art of sales. You're watching Greatness Quest on the Whatever It Takes Network.
Greatness Quest, and we're learning from the sales warlord, Gulliver Giles, and we're talking about sales, and there's so much stuff we're just talking about. I said, where do you find your client, your, your target client? I get that all the time. People say, I just need a higher quality of uh, prospect, and what you just told me, and I, I set you up because I wanted to find out what you thought. You said you don't find them, you make them. It's about you growing that relationship and and treating your client with love and offering them a lot of value and helping them and loving them, loving them enough to care about them, to ask great questions, to find out how you can serve them. And then I'm guessing you think it's a disservice to not make the sale. Am I missing something? If it's the right person. Yeah. So Zig Ziglar, you know, if you want to make a million dollars, find a bunch of people, make them a million dollars. That's how you find a high paying client. You help them make a lot of money. Me and Frank sold a hundred thousand dollar program together, um, and I got up in a room of forty five people, pooing my pants with fear because it's the most I'd ever charged. And I was saying to Leela the night before, you know, I'm, I'm really worried about this. It's a lot of money. Do you think that it'll work out okay? And she said to me, "Honey, you're gonna do what you always do. You're gonna get up on stage, dressed as a Viking, make them laugh, talk to them about their problems, help them understand they don't have to be frightened of objections and sales. Help them understand sales is love." And you're going to go through your process, and at the end, you're going to make an offer, and they're either going to say yes or they're not, and if they don't, well, fuck them. You tried to help. In a room of 45 people, we had 14 applications. And I was, I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe I did that. And it's like, it's about creating enough value. So your high-paying clients are everywhere. Money is everywhere. If you have the ability to create value, the right people will go, hey, man, that guy cares. That guy is valuable. I want more of that. Did I hear you just say that you dress up like a Viking on stage and Constantly. you made – yeah? <laughs> Come on. You, I mean like with freaking horns and stuff? Yeah. And you used to be – tell me about your past. I think I, when we were talking briefly between uh, breaks here, you said that you were a former punk rocker. Tell me about this a little bit of your background. When I was young, I wanted to be a musician, and when I was 16, my dad said, you can't do that. And I said, okay, well, you know, fuck you, dad. And But deep down, I believed him. Um, so I got a bunch of day jobs to support my music habit and to buy guitar strings and afford to have amplifiers and all that kind of stuff like you do when you're a young guitarist. And I basically wanted to sleep with girls, take drugs and play music. That was all I cared about. And I woke up at the age of 24. My hair had started to fall out. It wasn't the beautiful long mop of punk hair and uh, the beer gut was getting a bit bigger. My hormones had kind of slowed down a bit and my metabolism had slowed down and here we go. So. Suddenly, the girls that used to be chasing me were running in the opposite direction. I thought, oh, this is no good. So I took stock and I said, what am I good at? And I'm good at talking. I'm good at talking to people, right? So I got into corporate. I cut off all my hair. I got a suit, started dressing nicely. But deep down inside, the rebel never died, right? So flash forward 20 years, you know, or maybe 10 years, I met Leela and she said, you're miserable. And I said, screw you. I've got a shiny car and a mortgage and I'm a man and I've got money and, you know, I'm awesome, but I was miserable. I hated my life. I was a sales manager making, you know, sort of close to close to six figures, but not really doing real good because I hated what I was selling. I didn't really believe in it, and I was that miserable, self-loathing salesperson. So we started the business, and entrepreneurship gave me the ability to do whatever I wanted. So I created this archetype that. Thor the sales warlord who was this Viking guy who could smash you. And I created him because I was so so scared and so in debt and so screwed up by the years of commission sales and the ups and downs of starting a business. I almost lost my house, ended up selling it to, to pay all my debts from previous years. And I was in this terrible place of feeling inauthentic. So I thought, I'll create something, someone who can transcend that. And so that's where Thor came from. And when I met Frank, I finally realized, you know, I'm doing seven figures. I don't have to dress up like a Viking and be Thor the sales warlord anymore. So I rediscovered in the last couple of years, I've, I've come back to myself and said, right, you are all of these things. You created all of these things. You are this person. You can be this person. And that's been the biggest spiritual growth that I've ever had is, is realizing that you don't have to be afraid and you don't have to become someone else to be a good salesperson. You can actually be that person and you can have the love and the self-respect, the light and the dark the ability to be both of those things in balance. <clears throat> so there's some great stuff that you're talking about here, and I want to point something out. I'm interviewing you because I know you to be an extraordinary salesperson. And what I mentioned before when we were talking privately is there's a difference between somebody being really good at something 
and somebody being really good at something and teaching it to another human. So the fact that you do this as your profession gives I have a lot of respect for because that's what I do. I, I teach people to improve their communication skills and make more sales. Oh no, make more sales. But what you said was really cool and I want people to pick up on it. You were going to make a new offer. You know, when you, let's go back to this. You, you were working with Frank. Uh, this is Frank Kern, by the way. If you guys haven't heard of him, he's an online marketer, phenomenal, um, very successful consultant. And he, uh, you were going to go up on stage and you felt nervous. You were like, oh no, I feel uncomfortable. What if I screw people? You were scared. And I think people assume that, oh, I, you know, if I feel any anxiety, then I don't know my sales process. I don't have confidence. I start to get butterflies on my stomach. I don't know what I'm doing. And they start to freak out and get that fear. And what you also said is you have learned, and it's a bigger spiritual awakening for you, to go ahead and get more conscious about, you know what? I am me. I've got everything I need right now. I don't, I don't need to pretend to be Thor. I can utilize that strategy, but I am who I am, and you don't have to be afraid of that. And the more you embrace yourself and your, your, your authenticity, the better you sell, the better you communicate, the more you help people. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I'm getting from what you just said. Correct. I think it's 100% about business sales is the biggest personal growth spiritual journey you're ever going to go on. Yeah, totally. And it, it makes you realize so many different lessons. Every month, a new lesson. Every year, a new lesson. And, and the success is great, but the, the zeros on the end of the failures are bigger as, as the zeros on the end of the success. So it, you have to become a bigger person. And like said, Rocky says in the movie, you know, it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep getting back up and overcoming. And the more I overcome, the more I become, the more I can be to my audience, the more I can help them. I love it, my friend. Now, we've talked about a few different things. You said it's not about the money at one point. You said, you know, uh, but what? let's talk about some of the results. We were Facebooking when I first met you, and you sent me some messages, and you said one of your strategies is you will go in with, uh, what, what do you call it, a residential uh, process? Tell me about a little bit about the residential process or whatever you call it. At the moment, as I talk to you, I'm in the middle of a three-day residential in Arizona where I come in look at your sales script, look at your system, look at your stuff, get on the phone with your team and force them to make money. So I do that with corporates for three days and then I do consulting on the back end um, if they've got a team. With individual entrepreneurs, we lock them in our house for nine days and force them to make sales. So those are the sorts of events where we know I think the leading the leading record holder at the moment has done about $580,000 in a week. And it's showing generally six-figure to mid six figure entrepreneurs how to produce a seven figure business attitude and how to implement at that level and how to really hustle properly because our problem where we started out was we would have this awesome content like I'm giving you right now but people can go oh, that's some great content I've got a, a nice warm feeling in my crotch about it and awesome I did something for my business by listening to this fucking podcast today and that's it but getting them, forcing them, standing over their shoulder and saying, right, get on the phone, handle that objection, do that, <clears throat> money comes. So we started, we took this on the road, we did it, we used to do this event three days called uh, Sales Dominance, where we'd get you to actually do all of these things. And the record I think we had in Melbourne last week was $667,000 in five hours in the room with 50 entrepreneurs. And these were guys like from life coaches all the way through to a media agency. $200,000 of that was the media agency because he was selling $100,000 deals. But everybody gets on the phone. Everybody handles objections sooner or later. Showing them it's possible and it's not evil or creepy breaks them through. And that's been massive. A buddy of mine told me about your experience. I think you're on your way to Las Vegas. And we were, and I, I said, hey, we should set up this interview. We'll do it on Skype. You know, I need to do it in the next 48 hours. And you said, well, I can do it now, and so that's why we're here. And then you yeah. said you're on your way to Vegas. You'll be there in a couple of days. And my buddy attended one of your uh, events. I think it was like a weekend event. He said he did right. the same thing. You you taught him some strategies. Um, he got on the phone and made sales, made offers. He said he closed forty eight thousand dollars worth of sales in that one little call to action piece at your at, at your seminar. So what I love about what you're hearing is. I want you to know results. I mean, everybody watching right now, I mean, the expectation is, is this guy's full of shit, you know, because it's sales, you know, 
And that's completely crap. What we're trying to talk about here are results. What are you going to say? Let me say something. These results aren't typical. They're not typical. These people, they're out of, a, out of a nation of 300 million people. There were 50 people at Vegas. Yeah? This is not your 3,000 people at a seminar who've come to learn the secrets of playing on the internet and the avoidance of calling people. Right. This is the creme de la creme. No one does what we do. No one has the balls to do what we do. And no one has the guts our client have. You know? Like out of 300 million people in America, we're talking about 50 people had the guts to show up in the, in, at that event, right? That's so it's not, it is, it's bullshit. For 99% of people, it is a load of shit. It's a load of shit because they're full of shit and they'll never do shit because they are shit. Sorry. <laughs> I love it. Talk to me about your sales objection strategy. Again, this is something we talked offline about. I don't know anything about it, but you said a lot of people get into a rebuttal thing. They get an objection and then they fight back. And it is a fight oftentimes. How do you do it differently? It's a rebuttal. High school debating. Okay, we've got the argument here that, you know, creationism versus evolutionism or whatever it is. And the team gets up and puts their argument as to why God created the earth. And the other team gets up and puts their argument as to why that's a bunch of crap. And then they rebut each other. No, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. Rebuttal. Rebuttal book. I've got a book full of rebuttals. So, hey, I'm going to sell you some shares. No, I don't want shares. Well, that's why you're a pussy. You know, that kind of style of sales works on pussies who then refund and sue you and you go to jail. Because yeah. they're easily convinced. Yeah. What did you say before? The man convinced? It was a, uh, a man convinced against his will is of the same mind still. So like you said, the pussy. Beautiful. So he has been lame enough to do something he really shouldn't have done and will never take responsibility for it and you will get a refund. The FCC, the freaking IRS, whoever it is are going to crawl up your ass with a microscope. As soon as that enough pussies hit critical mass... Yeah, it's like that. It's like that. What? What is it? That 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 scene in um in in Team America. Yeah, there are pussies and there are dicks and there are assholes. Right? <laughs> I forgot what was the what was the song on that thing. Team America it was a real catch. Like we're gonna. I don't remember. There's a, there's a lot of good stuff in that movie, but I guess my point is, yeah, don't be a dick. Yeah. Rebuttal is force on force. It's lose-lose. It's old school in not in a good way. So, so it's manipulation. The difference between manipulation and ethical persuasion is what? One, you're trying to screw someone, and one, you're trying to serve someone. Intent. Your intent is to screw them or serve them. How I need to use my armor of God is it's not a tactical, you punch me, I punch you, I kick your knee, you elbow my head kind of tit-for-tat fighting. It's a strategy where it's like, right, I need to look at the overall strategy of how I can get this top, this problem solved rather than resorting to fisticuffs. So the dip you just said it quickly here, so I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure I capture it. The armor of God compared to a rebuttal. So as soon as they throw that objection to me, I'm gonna knock it back to them. Not that, but using the armor of God. Did I get that right? Exactly. So the armor of God it has that element in it but it's couched inside a strategy. So I'll give you the strategy. There are five key objections, time, money, information, partner, trust, right? Everything else derives from those. So this handles all those objections in a pattern, which you can redeploy and redeploy and redeploy. Step one, active listen. I hear what you're saying, sir, and it sounds a lot like you're saying you have no money at the moment. Step two, reward. I want to reward you for being so honest. It must hurt to say that. I know you're a proud business person. Money's always an issue for everybody, whether you're at six figures, seven or eight, there's always cash flow pinches and we've all been there. And I want to reassure you, step three, reassure. I want to reassure you, man, I've been there myself. And there are days when you've got $10,000 in your savings account and there are days when you've got negative 67 cents and you can't afford to buy milk because you had to pay wages and some deals didn't come through and I've been there too. Step four, remind. I want to remind you, over the last hour that I've been consulting to you, we've come up with a plan to create six to seven figure growth in your company over the next six to 12 months. And I want to realign, step five, realign. I want to realign you with that because that's what you told me you really, really wanted needed to create the freedom for your family, to create 
the ability to be able to be the man you want to be on your own terms and to be free of being in this constant jerking off the dog to feed the cat cash flow poverty situation you were telling me about. And we want to solve that, correct? So let me reframe you a little bit. There's two stories I want to tell you. Number one, once upon a time, there was a man named Trevor who really wanted to grow to seven figures and beyond, but he was stuck because of a cash flow issue. And he spent an hour on the phone to the mentor and the mentor said, here's how you can make seven figures if we just change these things and start creating these leads and start using this system to make these sales. And Trevor really, really wanted to believe it, but he was scared, so scared about how he had no money. And in this moment of choice, of decision, he said, you know what, I'm so scared that I'm going to freak out and not do this and get off the phone and I'm never going to pick up the phone to that Gulliver guy again because he was so persuasive. And he scared me with the potential for my future. I was so terrified to do it that I pooed in my pants and ran screaming back into the darkness and stayed stuck. Now, that's not a very positive story. Let me tell you a more positive story. Once upon a time, there was a brave guy called Trevor. He really wanted to change things. He really needed to change things. And he had not, not, not a hell lot of money. And he said to Gulliver, look, I'm terrified, but I need to change this. Can I give you my Amex? I will put down like a dollar, five dollars, a hundred dollars. I'll empty my Amex out and I will go and find the rest. I will do whatever it takes. Tell me, what could I do to, to hustle up that first payment? How could I do it? So do you see the difference between these two guys? One of those guys really, really wants it, but he's so scared that he does nothing yeah. about it. And the other guy really, really wants it and he's scared, but he does it anyway. Guess which one of those guys is going to win? So contrast is the next step. Which one of those guys do you want to be? Which one of those guys do you think is going to dig his way out of this hole? Because I can support you, but I can only be as in as you are. Are you number one guy who's too scared and can't do it, can't, 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 too scared, no money, too scared, wah, wah, wah? Or are you, you know what, fuck it. I'm going to do this no matter what. Which one are you? Trial close. Next step, trial close. So if I could help you get that start. What can you put down today to get started? Hard close. So would you like to use Visa, MasterCard, or Amex? So we're still giving him the contrast, but it's not a you're a little pussy bitch kind of contrast. It's a look, you can do this and you're going to get fucked, or you can do this and you're going to win. Which one do you want? Love it, man. This is great stuff, and I'm really glad that we're talking. So give me uh, – we're going to give a gift away. We always do that. Uh, you've got the – Art of the Sale is our giveaway, and I want people to have more access to you. So if you guys go ahead and get the gift, which I'm sure you're going to because you'd be an idiot not to, um, we're going to go ahead and give you more access to Gulliver so you can get some of this great stuff. Because when I asked you what you wanted to give away, there were like four or five things. You were just so giving, so serving, and I know I want to consume it, so I know that my uh, viewers are going to be are as well. So tell me about the Art of Sale so people know that what they're getting. Well, look, over the last seven, eight years, we've really built a really big presence on Facebook and we're well known as being the kind of out there, hardcore sales consulting guys. Um, we're a little bit crazy. So what we did was I have a brain like a bumblebee. Like I'm all over the shop, coaching, training, selling, flying around the world, doing all this stuff. And I don't have time to write a book. I would love to, but I'm constantly doing stuff. So what happened was we actually had our PA go through my whole Facebook page, get a whole bunch of the most pithy, salient, vinegar quotes and put together this kind of inspirational little book. It's, it's interesting because for me, I think probably like yourself, I take for granted what I know and I'm like, wow, it's just a bunch of Facebook stuff stuck together in a PDF. But I had this multi, multi, multi-millionaire call me the other day, great friend, partner, uh, sort of a guy who... In a conservative, multi-million dollar corporate kind of world, this guy recognizes the crazy value of what I do. And I'm so flattered and blessed to have friends like that, like Frank and Johan, this guy. He was in a multi-million dollar deal with this customer that was treating him like crap. And he, he, he switched off his computer. He picked up his, his Kindle. He downloaded my book. He said, I'm going to take a break from this horrible deal that I'm trying to put together with this asshole client. And he read my Art of Sales. And in there, one of the things said... You are not for sale. Your product is for sale. Your service is for sale. But your self-respect is not for sale. You are never for sale, not at any price. And he burst into tears. He's a multimillionaire, but he realized he'd been selling his self-respect for money to this client. So he fired this client. He said, you know what? 
can have your fucking money. Fuck you. Moved on. And his business went because he made room for better clients and he set a higher standard for himself. So I take for granted that that's just a bunch of stuff I wrote on Facebook on my wall. But if it can make a difference to the greatest of guys, the strongest of guys, the richest of guys, one of the richest people I know, if it could make a difference for him, it could probably make a difference for you too. And you might find it fun and amusing. You might find it activating. It might piss you off. And if it does, if it pushes your buttons, I challenge you to friend me up on Facebook. I'm Gulliver, G-U-L-L-I-V-E-R, Giles, G-I-L-E-S. Friend me up and tell me what you thought about it because honestly, I will give and give and give to teach people. I love people and I want to help you because I want to help myself, obviously, and self-interest. I'd love to sell you something if it's appropriate for you. But I really, really, really would love to talk to you. Brother, thank you so much. Uh, is there? I, I feel like asking like, my last question. Is there anything else that you want to tell someone? They're watching this right now. You just said go to your Facebook page. I think that's a perfect uh, piece because then they get to stay connected with you. I'm going to give them access to you again in the future as we get to connect. Anything else you want to give someone as a final call to action? If you are scared of sales, if, if it freaks you out, Stop thinking about you and start thinking about them and how you can solve their problems. If you're not systemized, you love people but you have no system, remember that the, the, the process that you give them is the proof of the profit of your product for them. So your process becomes the proof of the profit of your product for them. Whether that's a hard come outcome or a soft outcome, whether it's make money or get well, process you take them through becomes the proof of the profitability of the product. And if you're a leader of people, if you know, like yourself, Trevor, if you know more about sales, you've forgotten more about sales than anyone you know, and you'd like to stop being the frontline salesperson in the business and have a team of people who you could download your wisdom into, I would love to work with you one-on-one -on -one to help transmute your brain and your sales processes into a system that you could build an army of warriors who can one day replace your efforts entirely so you can be free. But it means taking off your expert hat and being the student. And that's where most CEOs have the biggest trouble because you've built this empire. It's hard to learn from someone. But if you want someone to talk to who will call you on your crap lovingly but firmly to help you build that, I am here for you. And I want to thank you very much, Trevor, for giving me the time today. Thank you, and we're going to have you back, obviously, and give people act more access to you. So you're watching Greatness Quest. We'll see you here next week. I'm going to bring you someone else extraordinary, and I uh, can't wait to see you soon. So take action. Greatness Quest is also available for download on iTunes and Stitcher. See the link in the description below.